we were to draw it out would be a carbon ring, but it has to, it actually turns into a carbon strand. So it looks like that. Okay. So we have uh, carbon. And then what we do is, is that we phosphorylate it. So we add a phosphate group. And so um, it's going to eventually be three carbon with a phosphate group attached to it. So this would be three carbon structure with a phosphate group attached, okay? So I'm breaking it apart, right? And so where do I, where do you think I get these phosphate groups? What other molecule can give up phosphate groups um, in order to uh, break down substances that uh, phosphorylate them? Yes, so ATP. So I would need two ATP, right? And then I, I'm gonna put in my little chemical reaction here that this ch changes it to two ADP. So I took the phosphate group off of the ATP. So now this is just diphosphate, right? And I needed two ATPs because I needed to phosphorylate each one of those, okay? So then, that's the first step. So this actually takes energy. So I'll put my first step takes energy. Okay. The second step actually um, produces, a, produces energy, and so we actually have a net gain of energy after this chemical reaction occurs, okay? So we're going to take those um, two molecules that we produced, and we're going to produce two pyruvates, All right? So I'm just going to put here. So a pyruvate and a pyruvate, okay? And so when I do this conversion, two ADP is going to be converted into um, to ATP, and this is times two, because each one of these molecules is gonna go through this, so this is my times two. So each one of these molecules is gonna be converted into pyruvate, and so this is going to be a net four ATP, okay? So that's um, uh, storing energy, because we've now taken the phosphate group off and we put it back into ATP, and then we also produce NAD, which is, sorry, NAD, and that's a positive, and we're going to reduce it, which means it's gonna gain an electron, so, or a hydrogen atom, so it's gonna turn into NADH, and there's gonna be two of those, too. Okay. So we have produced four ATP, Right? And we use two ATP, so the net gain is two ATP molecules. Okay, so that is not very much energy compared to what we're going to find out is going to happen when we take these pyruvates and we oxidate them and we um, break them down in the presence of oxygen in the mitochondria. Okay. okay, this is a very interesting molecule. So let's review that molecule. This is actually a B vitamin and it's um, niacin. So NAD positive is actually, we, it is derived from a vitamin, a B vitamin. So it's derived from niacin, right? And it can store energy, so it can be reduced. So remember that reduction is gaining. So remember that we use the terms oil rig. So reduction is where you gain electrons, or you gain hydrogen atoms, or you hug the um, electrons closer to you. So this is, it is being reduced to NAD. H. Okay, so this is a B vitamin. I think it's, I wrote that down. What was it? Uh, B1, I think it was. 
the first B vitamin maybe. I can't find it in my notes. Okay, never mind. Okay, so it is a B vitamin. Can't remember which number. Okay. So this is one of the reasons why you have to have B vitamins in your diet. Is, is that like ATP, they can store energy. So we can actually take this and then we can release it as energy, okay? So what we see here, gain, sorry, two ATP, two ATP, okay? So what we see here is, is that now you need to do something with the pyruvate because the pyruvate either needs to be broken down further or it needs to be recycled, okay? So we're gonna look at what happens when oxygen is not present, okay? And this is what is referred to as lactic acid fermentation. So this is anaerobic. So this is the recycling of pyruvates when O2 is not present. It is actually done by bacteria as well as our body cells. So the type of bacteria that do lactic acid fermentation are called lactobacilli. So these are bacteria that produce lactic acid. And so this is the type of bacteria that is found in yogurt. So um, we talked about or we saw that a lot of people in the world are unable to digest lactose, right? Lactobacilli can digest it and then they also can um, break it down into, they turn it into glucose and then they break it down into um, pyruvate and the end product is lactic acid. And so that's why yogurt is thick, because it turns the milk acidic, right? So yogurt is acidic. And what happens is, is that the proteins that are in the milk come out of solution, and that's what makes yogurt thick. So you're actually fermenting, you're actually putting bacteria and into the milk and fermenting it to make it thick, and it breaks it down so that it is more easily digestible by organisms like humans, right? So if you can't digest milk, you might be able to eat yogurt, right? And lactobacilli are actually also good bacteria that we have in our digestive tract and elsewhere in our body that produce an acid that keep us healthy. So for example, we actually um, have an acid um, exterior um, on our surface of our skin that actually helps to prevent um, bad bacteria from reproducing on the surface of our skin. So it's called the acid mantle. Okay, so this is also done by muscle cells. So it is also in the muscle cells. So sometimes you hear about muscle cells and if you're exercising and it's not aerobic exercise, so it's anaerobic exercise like lifting weights. When you lift weights, you're using your muscles, but you're not generally breathing really hard. And so oftentimes your muscles have a lack of oxygen. And so muscle building can sometimes cause lactic acid buildup in the muscles. And it's not as efficient as aerobic exercise, which would be like running, where you are um, breathing heavily and you're supplying your cells with lots of oxygen. So this occurs in the muscle cells during anaerobic exercise. And weightlifting and even yoga sometimes is anaerobic because we use our muscles but we're keeping our breath nice and you know it doesn't we're not heavily breathing heavily during it so sometimes it turns into anaerobic exercise okay. so it's a byproduct of um, breaking down and recycling pyruvate so when we look at pyruvate and pyruvate is actually pyruvate and pyruvic acid are the same thing so if you see some place where it's written as pyruvic acid it's the same thing so if we look at this chemical reaction, pyruvate 
is converted into lactic acid. And this NADH is oxidized to NAD positive. And so we're actually also recycling the NADH that was produced during glycolysis. So why is this oxidation? What is, what is oxidation? What does the oil stand for? Losing. Right? So NADH is oxidized because it's losing a hydrogen atom, and it's also losing an electron, and that's why it becomes positive. Right? Okay. So in your book, they have a diagram showing lactic acid fermentation. Right? And because there's two pyruvates after glycolysis, this means that this occurs twice, right? So they have two pyruvates, two lactic, this is the same thing as lactic acid, right? And we have two NADs. Okay, so sometimes we can take that pyruvic acid and we can turn it into alcohol. So if you're making and fermenting beer, for example, this is what you do, right? And so you generally, if you're making like a beer at home, You'll put it in a container and then you'll seal it off from oxygen, right? So you don't want oxygen getting in there because what you want is anaerobic metabolism to happen. And you also don't want microbes getting in there. So what they generally do is you just kind of seal it off and then you put an airlock on there so that a little bit of air can get in and a little bit of air can get out. But the microbes and the bad things can't get in, right? So you get good microorganisms that you convert to the pyruvic acid to acetyl aldehyde, and CO2 is a byproduct, so that's the carbonation if you were going to you know, create beer, for example. And then acetyl, F, acetyl aldehyde is then converted into ethanol, and the NADH is oxidized to NAD positive. Okay, so you don't need to know that chemical reaction, it's just that ethanol is another um, we um, don't do that metabolism, but other microbes do. Yeast does as well. So you can ferment grapes, for example, using specific uh, strains of yeast, which will turn the sugars into alcohol. Okay, so we're going to next talk about the citric acid cycle. So this has another name, and you'll see it written as the Krebs cycle, and that is named after the person that um, discovered it, right? And so this is specifically, a, you know, if you are going to um, uh, take a class, a 300-level chemistry class that's called biochemistry, you would study the Krebs cycle. So biochemistry. Um, and and um, it's just a study of how all these chemical reactions are occurring inside of your cells. Okay? So this would just be something that you might study in detail in biochemistry. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go over an overview of it. Okay? So this is citric acid cycle. This occurs in the mitochondria. So if you remember what our mitochondria look like, they look like little organisms that have been incorporated into a larger cell. So they actually kind of look like little bacteria. So they're kind of shaped like this in the cell. And they have a, an internal membrane, which is called the cristae. So I'm going to write this internal membrane. Okay. And this is my mitochondria, and these, this internal membrane is called the cristae. And so that membrane is a, a plasma, a phospholipid bilayer plasma membrane, and it has embedded in it little um, proteins, and those proteins are going to be really important. So the plasma membrane proteins inside the cristae are going to be really important um, uh, to this chemical reaction. Okay, so this occurs in the mitochondria and it is aerobic. So oxygen comes into the inside of the cell and it goes into the mitochondria. 
So oxygen can diffuse right across the plasma membrane, remember, because our plasma membranes are permeable to oxygen. So it just diffuses into the inside of the cell and then diffuses into the inside of the mitochondria. So the whole reason why we take in oxygen with each breath is what is happening, what we're going to talk about now, which is happening in the mitochondria. Okay. The byproduct of this is eventually going to be carbon dioxide, which is going to have to diffuse out, and our respiratory system picks that up, and we breathe it out, right, and water, and ATP. So before the citric acid part of the cycle starts, we need to take pyruvic acid, or pyruvate, pyruvate, and we're going to turn it into a molecule that can then be fed into the, um, the citric acid cycle. So pyruvate is converted to what a chemical called acetyl-CoA. Now, pyruvate has three carbon molecules, or atoms, excuse me, three carbon atoms attached to it. Acetyl-CoA has only one, no, has only two, sorry, and so it looks like this, COA, okay. So we've lost a carbon right off as we've converted this to acetyl-CoA, okay. This requires um, uh, addition of energy, and so we add or we take NAD positive. Actually, it's reduced here. And NADH, sorry. Okay, so that would be um, what is required to change pyruvate into, so this actually is gaining energy because it's being reduced. And then we're losing a CO2 molecule right off the bat. So the carbon dioxide comes off right there. And the carbon dioxide is that carbon that we lost here, right? Because we only have two carbons in our acetyl -cola. So acetyl combines with a four carbon molecule. So it combines with four, a four carbon molecule. And you don't need to know the name of that. That's called oxaloacetic acid. But these combine together and they form citric acid, which is six carbons. Okay, so we have six carbons here. One, two, three, four, five, six, okay. So this is citric acid. Okay. So remember that we have two pyruvate from the initial glycolysis. So in order for one glucose molecule to be broken down completely through glycolysis of the citric acid cycle, it has to occur twice. Right? So, so each, this is going to occur twice, right? So I'll put times two, right, because there's two pyruvates, okay. So what we're going to be doing during the citric acid cycle is we're going to be breaking the bonds between the carbon, and that is going to release energy that will allow us to produce high-energy molecules like NADH and like ATP and like FADH, okay. So the, I'm just going to draw a big circle here, and it's going to come around, and it's going to end at that four carbon molecule up there. Okay. So this is my cycle that you that we're just going to summarize here. Okay. So when we look at the cycle, we see that NAD positive is reduced to NADH, oops, NADH, okay. So that's gaining energy, and this is gonna happen three times. So there's gonna be three of these molecules being formed. So NAD is gonna be, is gonna gain energy, and it's gonna 
produce this. And we're also going to lose in our cycle, so just one arrow coming out, we're gonna lose carbon dioxide, right? And we're gonna lose two um, carbons from this chain because we're starting out with a six carbon molecule and we're gonna end up with a four carbon molecule. So that means that we're going to lose two carbons. And so this is times two. Okay. We're going to produce an ATP, so this is ADP, ATP, right, so that's gaining energy. And then there is another chemical that we haven't talked about, which is FAD, and this is another um, B vitamin. This is actually um, riboflavin, I think. I think it's B3. So this is a B vitamin that can pick up electrons and gain hydrogen atoms and it's got a little positive there, and it is actually converted to FADH2. Okay, so it is picking up energy. So the whole point of this that I want to emphasize is that as we break covalent bonds in this organic molecule, we're then taking the energy from those covalent bonds and we're producing these high energy molecules, ATP, NADH, FADH2, right? And then we're also producing as a byproduct carbon dioxide. Now notice that there is no oxygen yet. So you're like, I don't understand where the oxygen comes from. So that's the next um, couple of stages, okay? So that's the Krebs cycle. So then what we wanna do um, so this is a, oops, this is the diagram from your book that shows this. Right? So acetyl-CoA, right, combining to form citric acid, citric acid being broken down and releasing CO2 and building these high energy molecules. Okay. So we're going to come to the next part, which is called the electron transport chain. Okay. The electron transport chain is due to um, proteins that are inside the plasma membrane of the cristae. So if I were to look at those cristae, right, in a little bit more detail, this is just a piece of the cristae. Inside that, there's these proteins. So these are the proteins. Okay. So those are the proteins. And those proteins are going to um, transport the <coughs> electrons that are given up by NADH and FADH2. Okay. So if we look at um, the transport um, here, so NADH right, is going to be converted to NAD positive, and this is going to um, give off two electrons. The electrons are going to be picked up by those proteins. So these are picked up by the proteins. And are moved. And anytime we have the movement of electrons, that is electricity. Oops. Ah. So electricity is simply the movement of electrons, and that can be in a wire, like when we are turning on our lights at home, or it can be electricity moving from the proteins in the cristae of the mitochondria, okay? So they pick up the proteins, picked up by proteins and moved along a chain, right? This is electrical energy, that is used to pump hydrogen ions to the outside of the, the internal membrane, okay? So the energy produced from the movement of those electrons is used to pump hydrogen ions okay, out of 
the inside membrane, or inside space of the mitochondria. Okay. So what they would do is, is that if this is my cristae and this is my the whole mitochondria, is hydrogen gets moved to the outside. So I can draw my rest of my cristae here. So hydrogen gets pumped to the outside. Not the outside of the mitochondria, but the outside of this inner space. Okay. So in your book, they have this, they show this electron transport chain, and each one of these proteins actually has a name but you don't need to remember the names, okay? So notice here, NADH is losing electrons, so it is being reduced, right? No, it is being oxidized, sorry. It is being oxidized because oxidation is needed. But this just shows the movement of the electrons. As the electrons move, they fuel, they power the active transport of hydrogen ions out. One um, uh, protein that you might have heard of before is called cytochrome C. And cytochrome C is a protein that is found in all living things. Um, so it's a protein that all organisms have. Um, so it's a very ancient, um, the genetic material that codes for that protein is very ancient. Now, at the end of the electron transport chain, we now have the whole sole function of the oxygen, right? So the oxygen actually is, ends up receiving the final um, flow of electrons, okay? So oxygen, the function of oxygen in this whole um, chemical reaction, okay? This is the final... Um, place where electrons are received. So if that was not there, then the electrons wouldn't have any place to go, right? And that would not, that means the chemical reaction would not be able to occur. So the electrons here, they show two, um, I will just put it here, sorry, H positive plus O2 gives you H2O, okay? So water is formed, okay? So see those two electrons right here, okay? They are picked up by the hydrogen and the oxygen and they form water. Okay. So, this whole thing is designed to set up a gradient potential that is going to allow for the production of lots of ATP. So the next part of this is called oxidative phosphorylation. And there is a protein that is responsible for this, which is called ATP synthase. So what type of molecule is this based upon its ACE ending? It is an enzyme. Okay. It's a very interesting enzyme. It produces ATP. So ADP, are, um, right, ADP plus P is converted to ATP. Right, that's the, the thing that does that. It is also takes, um, it's very interesting because it actually is a motor protein. So we talked about how some proteins can actually move. So they're actually capable of mechanical energy. And one of those that we talked about were the, the cytoskeleton and actually how they move, they walk, right? They walk the vesicles down the length of the cytoskeleton to move them to the outside of the cell. So this is a motor protein. Okay. Yes, the ATP synthase is a motor protein. So hydrogen ions, 
from the outside, so from the outer space from, of the cell, of the mitochondria, sorry, from the outer space in mitochondria, flow through this protein. And this flow of hydrogen ions is turned into mechanical energy. So it actually is like a turbine. So it actually causes the uh, synthase to spin. Okay, so the flow of hydrogen ions, because they've been built up to the outside, they come now in through the synthase, it spins, and then that mechanical energy is then turned into ATP. Right. And ATP is what type of energy? It's not mechanical. It would be, it's not mechanical energy. It is chemical energy. But that's a good, I'm glad that you said potential. So this is potential energy, right? What would this be? Kinetic energy. Okay, so that's kinetic energy. Okay, so if we look at um, the diagram from your book, this is the ATP synthase. Hydrogen has been pumped out, so now it's at a high concentration here. So it is gonna flood in, and as it floods in, it's gonna cause this um, motor to turn, and ADP is gonna be converted to ATP, okay? So this is the complex chemical reaction that is occurring inside your cell. So the citric acid cycle is producing the NADH, right? Electrons are being transported. Oxygen is combining with electrons to form water. ATP is being produced as hydrogen ions flood. So I have a cool video that now kind of demonstrates all of this. Right? Showing some interesting. Yes. Um, in our textbook online, um, when it's like one, two, three of those chapters. Yes. So what chapter would this be? This is chapter, actually those are units. So if you click on the units, this is chapter five. So it would be unit. I'm not sure what unit is in. Unit three maybe? Also, yeah. Okay. Oh, let me see if I can get sound. Uh, no, because you have all your notes in your in your thing. Because this just shows exactly what I was talking about. Ah, oh, shoot, where's the sound? Okay, let me just pause it for a second. Okay, I have to wait 20 seconds for the speakers to come on. Okay. Okay. Shh. The potential energy from these grains is often used to perform biological work. Here we will focus on hydrogen ion concentration gradients. Hydrogen ions are also known as protons. A gradient exists when there is a higher concentration of a molecule in one compartment compared to a neighboring compartment. This animation will demonstrate how the potential energy that results from a hydrogen ion gradient 
uses ADP and inorganic phosphate, also known as PI, to synthesize ATP. This process involves an enzyme complex called ATP synthase. Gradients and the potential energy they create are key aspects of the biological world. A good example of the use of a gradient occurs in the mitochondria when ATP is synthesized. ATP is synthesized by ATP synthase, a large complex of membrane-bound protein. Here we see ATP synthase, along with other membrane-bound proteins. Notice the large difference in the number of hydrogen ions on the two sides of the membrane. This difference is a hydrogen ion, or proton, concentration gradient. The energy associated with this gradient is used to synthesize ATP from ADP and PI. This occurs at the ATP synthase complex. One hydrogen ion enters the ATP synthase complex from the intermembrane space, and a second hydrogen ion leaves it on the matrix space. The upper part of the ATP synthase complex rotates when a new hydrogen ion enters. Once three protons have entered the matrix space, there is enough energy in the ATP synthase complex to synthesize one ATP. In this way, the energy in the hydrogen ion gradient is used to make ATP. Now let's watch the process again. Notice how the proton enters the ATP synthase and exits into the matrix space. Once three more hydrogen ions have crossed the membrane, another molecule of ATP will be made. In this example, the hydrogen ion gradient is large enough to produce six ATP molecules. Please watch as the remaining ATP molecules are synthesized. The process has now completed, and the result is an equal number of protons on each side of the inner membrane. Without a gradient, there is no more energy available to make ATP. In biological systems, however, a gradient is always maintained. The mitochondrial hydrogen ion gradient is generated as electrons pass through three membrane complexes. That process can be seen in the mitochondrial electron transport chain animation. So the electron transport chain creates the gradient difference, and then um, the hydrogen ion can flow through the ATP synthase to produce ATP. Okay, so that is why those both of those processes, actually three processes. So we have the citric acid cycle, we have the electron transport, and then we have oxidative phosphorylation. Those three things produce lots of ATP, right? So about 34 ATP are produced for every one glucose molecule. So that is assuming that it first goes through glycolysis, which occurs outside of the mitochondria, and it's also assuming that oxygen is present, and it's assuming that the glucose goes into the mitochondria, excuse me, not the glucose, but the pyruvate goes into the mitochondria, goes through the citric acid cycle, and then we have this process of producing ATP. So this would be in muscle cells where you have aerobic exercise. So when you're running long distances, for example, this would be the type of ATP production that your muscle cells would have to use in order to produce enough energy to maintain the um, mechanical you know, um, use of ATP to power the muscles. <coughs> OK, so I know that that is really kind of detailed, in-depth kind of stuff. Oops. Um, but I'm hoping that you can appreciate the complexity, right? That, um, and you can appreciate the scientists who kind of were able to figure that process out. Okay, so we are starting on a new chapter, and this is chapter six in your book. So tissues are groups of cells
that have a common structure and function. Embryonically, you have to remember that we start out as a single cell that then undergoes cell division to produce a lot of cells with the same genetic material. And then those cells will differentiate to become what are referred to as embryonic tissue layers. So we have unspecialized embryonic tissue layers. that give rise to our specialized tissue. Okay. So these have names based upon their orientation. So the ectoderm is on the outside. Okay. In the books, in all the books, this is a blue layer. So it's not blue, you know, in real life, but they always diagram it out. It's always the blue layer, okay? The mesoderm is the middle layer of the embryo, and this is red in color in the diagrams. And then the endoderm, is yellow. So that's the most inner one. So ecto means outside, endo means inside, meso means middle, derm in this case means a tissue layer, but also you think about the germ, um, the skin, right? So if we look at the ectoderm layer, this is going to become the skin, and the nervous tissue. So we are kind of strange in that our nervous tissue is derived by the outer layer. It's not the case in some other organisms like invertebrates. Earthworms, for example, would be different. So um, the nervous tissue is ectoderm. Mesoderm is muscle and skeleton. So muscle, bone, and connective tissue. Okay. Endoderm is the tissue that lines the inside of organs. So like the lining of our digestive tract. So this is the lining of internal organs. And it is also the digestive glands. So it's uh, digestive glands include, for example, the salivary glands. The liver is actually a digestive gland. The pancreas is a digestive gland. So that's the endoderm. Okay. So cells um, differentiate. Different genes are turned on and turned off in these different cells to give them their specific, uh, what they look like, but also what proteins they're producing, for example. So in muscle, we produce a lot of actin and myosin. In bone, there's a lot of collagen produced, right? In the nervous tissue, there's lots of neurotransmitters produced, okay? So we'll talk about um, specialization and gene regulation when we get to the genetics component of the class. Okay, so we are going to now talk about the different types of tissues that we find in your body. And there's a diagram that shows the four major tissue types, okay? So that is epithelial, which we're gonna talk about first, muscle, nervous, and connective tissue. Oh. Dang it. Okay, so we're going to start with epithelial tissue. So this is one of the major four categories. Okay. 
Epa means upon, and thelial means a layer. Okay, so this is the type of tissue that lines organs. Okay, so like the inside of your um, lungs would be epithelial tissue. The inside of your stomach is epithelial tissue. It also makes up the outer skin. And it makes up glands. Okay. So when we describe epithelial tissue, we can describe it based upon um, cell shape. For example, so sometimes the cells are flat, and that means that they would be squamous. So this means flat. Columnar means column shaped. Cuboidal means cube shaped. We can also describe epithelial tissue based upon layers, so number of layers. So if there is a single layer, we say that it is simple. So simple means a single layer. It, if it is stratified, that means that it is many layers. There are some tissues that are actually single layers of cells, but they look stratified. And so they are said to be pseudo stratified. So pseudo means false, right? So pseudo means that they look like they're stratified, but they're not. And it generally has to do with the placement of the nucleus. It kind of the cells have the nucleus in a different place, and so it looks like it's stratified, but it's not. Okay. And then we ask, is it ciliated? So what cilia are, are cytoplasmic extensions of the cell. So if I were to draw my cell like here. Okay. So this would be the cilia. This shape is columnar. And so this is actually simple columnar, simple ciliated columnar shape. Okay. You can describe it as being different things. If we have many layers of flat cells, Right? So if we have many layers of flat cells, what do you think that is? Stratified, stratified but it's actually squamous. Or no, actually, sorry, it is stratified first. Stratified, squamous, epithelial tissue. Right? So this would be like our outer surface of our skin is stratified squamous. The lining of our esophagus is stratified squamous. The lining of our sub stomach is actually simple columnar. So the stomach is not stratified because by the time our food gets down there, it's essentially turned into mush, right? And there's not a lot of friction in the stomach. But in the esophagus, where the food moves down, there's lots of friction. So the epithelial tissue needs to be protected. So it is stratified. So whenever we see the stratified, this is protective. Okay. It is protective if it is stratified. If it's simple, it is not protective. It can be easily damaged. Right. Oh, this is called columnar, simple columnar. 
it's not protective. So that would be like in your stomach. Your stomach doesn't have cilia. That would be like in your small intestine, which has cilia. Okay, <clears throat> so those are that is how we describe the epithelial tissue based upon cell shape and layers. So in your book, they have examples of these. Notice that the pseudostratified, the placement of the nucleus is kind of weird, and so that's why it looks like it is many layers, or two layers maybe, but it is not. So we'll look at one of those in lab today. Now, when we look at the epithelial tissue in particular, we have to think about how the cells are connected. So we can talk about cell junctions. And so this is another function of uh, plasma membrane proteins, okay? So in tight junctions, okay, there is connections between plasma membrane proteins. And this keeps it from being leaky, right? So it prevents fluids from leaking across the membrane. So that's a tight junction. So if we look at a picture in your book, right? So these would be the, um, the two cells, right? And these are the proteins. And notice that there's a tight connection between the two. And so nothing can get in between those cells, right? So like there would be tight junctions in your small intestine, you don't, sometimes they call it a leaky gut, right? You don't want bacteria getting into your circulatory system across your gut. If your small intestine has been damaged, so let's say you have celiac disease and you're, you have bleeding in your small intestine, sometimes you can get bacteria into your circulation and that can be bad. So tight junctions helps you create so that things cannot move through. So they're barriers, okay? We also have what are called desmosomes. And these anchor cells to one another. So rather than creating a barrier where things are coming across, um, this would be like um, the contraction of muscle. So um, it anchors one muscle cell to another. Right. So, for example, smooth muscle smooth muscle cells are anchored to one another. Okay. So, like when you have the contraction of your bladder, right? Those cells contract and it contracts as a whole. So the contraction of one cell pulls on another. Okay. So here, that's the same thing as these proteins that help to anchor the cells together. This is inside the cell, and so this is actually like cytoskeleton proteins that's kind of like nuts and bolts, actually. They kind of just anchor those, those two cells together. Okay. And then we have what are called gap junctions. And I remember gap junctions as being different because they create holes between cells. So they create gaps, okay? So gap junctions, all of these have to do with those proteins in the membrane. But gap junctions are where we have protein channels. Um, between cells that allow for the movement of ions. So ions are charged particles like sodium and potassium, 
right? So sodium and potassium can move directly from one cell to the other. And this is actually really important in heart muscle, which is called cardiac muscle. So in cardiac muscle cells, oops, muscle. So cardiac muscle is found in hearts and there's um, the flow of electrons, which would be the flow of charged particles are actually the flow of sodium and potassium and calcium from one cell to the other actually causes um, the um, cells to uh, depolarize and to eventually contract. So gap junctions are really important in cardiac muscle cells that allow for um, contraction without um, having to be stimulated by the nervous system. So this shows these little pores, right? So notice there's little gaps. So that's how you would remember that. Okay. So we're gonna talk about glands. So this is still under epithelial tissue, okay? So all glands are derived from epithelial tissue and epithelial tissue is mainly um, endoderm, derived from endoderm. So we have two different types of glands. The first one is called the exocrine gland. And this is a gland that um, transports its substances via a duct. So it transports secretions via a duct. So can anybody give me an example of an exocrine gland? Tear, sweat. So lacrimal, which is the tear gland. Okay, that actually sits like above your eye. So when you cry and it swells up, right? That's your lacrimal gland. Sweat glands, uh, salivary glands, um, mammillary glands. That's milk, right? And also um, pancreas, part of the pancreas that produces enzymes. So we have uh, pancreatic ducts that transport enzymes. So those would all be examples of exocrine glands. So if, if it's not an exocrine gland, then it is an endocrine gland. And endo means inside, right? But this means essentially that they are releasing their um, secretions into the circulation. So secretions are released into the blood and are transported to their target organs. So what are their secretions called? Hormones. Okay. So hormones are interesting because they're released into the blood. They go everywhere, right? But they only have, in most cases, they only have their target in one particular place. So like insulin is produced by the pancreas, but its target would be primarily the liver and the muscle cells because it targets them because those two types of cells can take up glucose and store it and then release it when it is necessary. So an example would be the pancreas has an endocrine portion as well as a, as a exocrine portion, but the pancreas can release insulin, which targets liver and muscle cells, 
causing them to remove glucose from the blood. Right. Insulin is a protein, so it actually has to bind to receptors on the outside of the cell to cause the response of the cells. So only cells with insulin receptors on them respond to insulin. So most hormones are um, protein-derived, although we do have some lipid-derived hormones. So what's an example of a hormone that is a lipid? Testosterone. So testosterone is produced in males in the testes, and testosterone is also produced by females in the adrenal glands, and testosterone has its effects um, in the muscles, for example. It causes increased muscle, it causes hair growth, right? It also kind of speeds up metabolism um, um, and gets you ready for activity, okay? So that is um, an example of a lipid-based um, protein. So if we look at these ducts, okay, um, let me look at the multicellular glands first. So most glands are composed of many cells. So if we're looking at like sweat glands, right? If we look at the sweat ducts, they're very short because the sweat glands are in the skin and they're producing sweat. And sweat is actually not just water. Sweat is also has acid in it, and it also has um, enzymes in it that kill bacteria. And it can also have antibodies that can protect you from infection, right? So this is an example of a sweat gland, right? So some of them are very simple, and some of them are more complex, right? So this is a salivary gland, mammary gland, right? Some of them can be very complex. We're not going to get there yet. Okay, so we also have what are called unicellular glands. So this means that they are a single cell. And this is a cell, um, so the example in our body is a goblet cell. And it's called a goblet cell because of its shape. So it kind of has a narrow base, right? And then it has a bigger thing. And we'll look at, we'll probably see goblet cells um, when we look at our tissues. Um, here you can see the nucleus is at this side. And then it has some rough ER. And it is, has a lots of rough, rough ER because it secretes mucin. And mucin is a protein. So remember that proteins that are to be secreted are produced at the rough ER. And then notice that they have these vesicles which are filled, and then it's going to release it and secrete it via exocytosis, right? So it releases it by producing vesicles that then fuse to the outer membrane. And mucin combined with water produces mucus. Okay. And mucus is actually, we think of it as being gross, but it's actually super important. Okay. Where it's most important probably is in the stomach and in the lungs, because it protects the stomach from self-digestion. Okay. So without that mucus, protective that without that mu mucous membrane, the acid of your stomach would destroy the lining of your stomach. And actually when you drink alcohol, alcohol destroys the mucus and it'll actually cause your stomach to bleed, as will um, aspirin and excessive salts will, will, will damage the mucous membrane. But in the respiratory tract, it's used, oops, in the respiratory tract, it's actually, it's actually used to, um, produce mucus, so it traps debris in the respiratory tract. Okay. 
So this is actually a picture of the trachea, which is part of your respiratory tract, and there's goblet cells that are producing mucus. So if you breathe in debris, it's caught by the mucus and it's pass back up your throat, you cough it up, and you generally swallow it. So we produce a lot of mucus that is swallowed from the rest of your tract. So that would be the unicellular glands in the body. Okay, so in lab, I'm going to give a brief introduction to the muscle, to the neurons, and to the connective tissue. So um, that lecture material will be provided at the beginning of lab, and then we're going to look at tissues in lab um, on Tuesday and Wednesday. Thank <laughs> you.